Become Auburn Beyond the White Coat, where we explore the multifaceted world of healthcare and medical education. Every episode, we will bring you insight conversations with experts, Become Auburn students, and healthcare professionals, revealing their unique experiences and perspectives. Get ready to delve into groundbreaking research, innovative treatments, and personal stories that will shape the future of medicine. Let's go beyond the white coat to uncover the human side of healthcare. Welcome back, everyone, to Become Auburn Beyond the White Coat. I'm your host, Brittany Lilla. Today, we are thrilled to have Dustin Howard, a third-year medical student and second lieutenant in the Air Force, along with John Peaks, chief and Dustin's former colleague at Auburn Fire Division. We'll be discussing their journey from emergency services to healthcare, their perspectives on services, and how Dustin balances medical school and his military duties. Let's take a look. Okay, so before we dive in, y'all, um, if you guys want to introduce yourself, start from- Yeah, I'm Dustin Howard. I'm a third-year medical student at uh, Become Auburn. I'm also a HPSB student for the Air Force and I hold the rank of second lieutenant. And I'm John Peaks. I currently work for the Auburn Fire Department as a battalion chief, but I spent the better half of 16 years here with Dustin Howard. Awesome. Thank you guys for the introductions and welcome you to how that we've heard a little bit about you both. Uh, Dustin, I would love to dive a little bit deeper into your journey. And if you want to share about a, a little bit about your background and how you went from the Auburn Fire Department and to now pursuing in medical school here at VCOM and on top of that, being in the Air Force, what motivated you to have that shift in career? Yeah, so the shift in career that one kind of developed over time and it kind of all starts back in the beginning when I was 18 years old, graduating high school at, uh, from Beulah High School. It's a little small rural community in Alabama, a very, very poor place. And my family was certainly not well off by any means. So I was kind of faced with the the tough decision and the tough position in life to where if I wanted to go to college, I had to find a way to get it paid for. Fortunately, through uh, some good friends who worked at the Auburn Fire Department that time, I found the Auburn Fire Department and started there in 2014 as a firefighter for them. Uh, that's where I originally met John Peaks, kind of trending more towards medical. And as I went along, I really loved being a firefighter and and I loved everything about it. I, I really wanted to Pursue something that had a teamwork atmosphere, and the fire department definitely has that. That's the greatest team I've ever been a part of, needs that I had in life. My goals were extremely nearsighted at 18 years old, as probably any 18-year-old would also admit to. So I continued with that. I loved it. I really loved being there for people. I really loved being there for patients, and so I decided to pursue my paramedic degree. I got that at Southern Union State Community College. I got that in about 2016 um, and then enjoyed being a, a paramedic and being a firefighter. But that carried a lot of gravity and a lot of weight because um, at that time I was only about 20 years old. And at 20 years old, when you're the highest pre-hospital care provider that anybody's going to get when they call 911, that's a lot of weight to make those life-saving split-second decisions or being the one who's got to make that life-saving intervention because nobody else can or nobody else will. Uh, that's a ton of pressure, you know, just keeping somebody alive to get them to the hospital. Um, I really enjoyed that. I always strive to be the best firefighter I could be, the best paramedic I could be, because I, I really felt like I owed that to the people that I was called to serve, and I owed that to my fellow firefighters. And so... I continued on that trajectory to try to be the best, pursue professional excellence and have integrity in all that I did. And so eventually over time, it began to morph in, in the terms of me wanting to be the best at my job to I wanted to be the best for patients. It was, for me, it was more long term. For me, it was more affecting their life and the way they thought. And so I wanted to, to, combat everything from their 
immediate situation, to their mental health, to their spirituality, to or, to their lifestyle factors, and so that began to um, propel me forward into thinking, hey, what job fits those roles? And so for me, that was to become a physician, and so I strove towards that. And I graduated Auburn in 2019 with a kinesiology degree, and so finished up and applied, and I knew that VCOM was the place I really wanted to go. And I was very lucky to get into VCOM. It is a nice tool. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, good. For John, um, how about you? Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and a a little bit of background of how you became chief? Yeah, yeah, I um, didn't really have uh, any aspirations of being a chief when I started this. And honestly, didn't even think about being a firefighter when I was in high school. And oddly enough, my mom thought I should build my resume so in doing that and i grew up and right outside of birmingham alabama and hoover and you know taking that with me when i graduate and she found a volunteer department called rocky ridge fire department which is still there today kind of near vestavia but they offered a explorer program where you could work on a shift and not really do much firefighting because we didn't have training but more spectate, and she thought, do this for a few years when you're 16, 17, and then when you graduate, it'll be a good resume builder. And then doing that, I fell in love with fire service. And so similar to him, I wanted two things, is to be a part of a team and continue that legacy, but also go to schooling and see where that takes me. And I found the student program, oddly enough, a few years before Howard, I went through in 2009, so started about six years before him, five, six years, and, uh, you know, just came to Auburn and actually didn't know a single person in Auburn. Lived with three people. I had no idea who they were when I moved down here through recruit school and made friends along the way. And uh, just doing that was able to form a pretty good base of friendships uh, over the years I've been here. And being in the student program, I was in it for maybe three or four years going to school for emergency management out of Jacksonville State University online. I was one of the few. And about three or four years after being a student, they offered a career job, got that. And that was about 2013 when I was graduating college and realized that I probably wanted to stay here. I enjoyed the people, the community. All awesome. Actually, my whole family's Alabama fans, oddly enough. And I decided to ban Auburn, so. There you go. War Eagle. Uh-huh, War Eagle, huh? So I mean, that's what I try to do is be the best that I can be. So I kept promoting, kept getting ranked that at my age was kind of very young. Now 16 years in, most recently, I've been promoted to the Iron Chief, Howard's. What he was saying is, He was one of the best firefighters I'd ever met, even better at being a paramedic. And I remember telling him multiple times that you will do something up in this fire department because you're better than all of us. You will go off better things in the fire department. And he is actually living that out now, studying to be a physician. It didn't surprise me when he wanted to go to medical school and left us as hard as it was for us to see him leave here because we lost a very valuable asset with an organization, uh, and I feel do even better things as a, a physician. Absolutely. And isn't that a wonderful <laughs> yeah, all the is, compliments is. that you just got? Yeah. Yeah. He's sappy. He's sappy. Well, no, but that's awesome to hear that you're such a, an impact on the fire department. And, and I'm sure that you guys have many types of stories that in the past when you guys were um, all working together. So that's awesome to hear that. No, but thank you, John, for telling your story and your background. And now I can only imagine firsthand the impact that pe- uh, people like Dustin have had on the field. Can you tell us a little bit um, more about that? Yeah, absolutely. And kind of my view of these professionals in the field of the fire service, you know, men, Howard, 
served for a long time. And whereas Howard, you know, shaped my view of it uh, significantly. So of many others, you know, it's kind of a collaboration of everyone that I've come in contact in this field has kind of shaped my view of it. I was his physical training instructor and fire instructor. So getting Howard where I thought he needed to be in the fire service. Uh, uh, and then oddly enough, Howard joined me and doing the physical training or crew school for almost 10 years. We did it together. You know, we trained hundreds of firefighters, uh, a lot of them still current, not just for the city of Auburn. We did a regional training site. So we trained a lot of departments in all of East Alabama went directly through myself and Howard in working with Howard and the others kind of shaped my view. You know, one of the biggest things is learning the amount of empathy responders have for others. You know, no one questions our determination per se, uh, to save another person. I mean, our job in itself is willingly going into house fires. Most don't see the empathy that these responders possess. I've learned that these first responders care more than people, you know, realize they care for their patients, many of which they've never met before. And, you know, I catch myself think about that sometimes as we risk our lives every day for people that we don't know and likely will never see again. Mm -hmm. you know, so what level of empathy does that take for somebody to do that? You know, they care for the people affected by these tragedies and they care tremendously for the other fellow responders they ride these trucks with. They have a natural calling for help, you know, calling to help. You'll never witness uh, an off-duty responder turning the other direction if the emergency happens. It's semi-comical, but when the emergencies happen, we often, when we're on duty, have to turn people away because there's so many of them that come out from everywhere asking to help. At some point, there's so many there that we can't do our job effectively. So they come together regardless of circumstance, regardless of their department, regardless of their backgrounds. We come together as one team, even if we've never met each other. And the goal and the mission, per se, is to help that other person that none of us have ever met. So it's actually kind of amazing to watch. To say the other thing, and Howard mentioned this uh, about himself, but it also extends to others, is their high drive to succeed. Um, an unparalleled willingness to risk their life for others. You know, and that made him an exceptional and impactful operator and responder. Uh, but there's plenty of us that have that same drive. And I think th those things shape my view of responders. And I know for a fact it will help you know, individuals like Howard succeed in the medical field. Absolutely. Well, that's great, John. And uh, thank you for that. And it's clear that people like Dustin can make a big difference out there. Uh, now, Dustin, it seems like your shift to medical school has a personal significance. What's been the most rewarding part of the journey for you? It's really meeting others in medical school was awesome because seeing seeing those brilliant minds all kind of coming together, meeting at a common point for kind of the same goal. And I met so many friends upon starting medical school whose, whose goal was to, to heal others, to fix the sick people that they see around them, to make the lives of others better in a way that only, only medicine can and only physicians can. People who would use the platform of physician and whatever social standing or academic clout, if you will, that holds to help others and to progress the lives of others. And so that was super duper rewarding. Meeting fellow minds who were far smarter than me, so many people that are just so smart. And that's just super rewarding to meet them and to know them and to call them friends. But personally, I guess the rewarding part that I see visually, I've seen in these clinical years, so being in my third year, I'm actually out doing rotations, and I'm able to see that the things that I hold dear, such as you know a lot of the lifestyle factors, um, such as exercise and diet and uh, mental health and things like that, that, that I hold really close. I now have the knowledge, I suppose, some of the experience and, and some of that platform to actually counsel patients 
on this thing so I can more meet that goal of, of healing them holistically and completely. I just wanted to tell them thank you. And so that's been so rewarding getting reports like that uh, for no matter where you are. It doesn't really matter. But I began to see similar presentations in all these patients, no matter who they were, no matter what they were. I began to see similar things. And it was those chronic health conditions that are so prevalent in our population now. So diabetes, heart disease, strokes, so lack of exercise, so sedentary lifestyle, poor diet, you name it, kind of the list goes on of those those high comorbidities that they preach in medical school and that they talk about all the time in health. And I began to see those threads intertwine in all the patients. And, and sometimes some of those factors cause their medical emergency. Uh, somebody who had developed type 2 diabetes, for instance, we might have gotten called to them because their sugar dropped excessively low. And so thus it caused their medical emergency. Or somebody who was inactive and ate a poor diet and had heart disease, had a heart attack. And so those things caused their emergency. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Dustin. Yes, ma'am. So it sounds like your journey has been incredibly fulfilling so far. but. There's no doubt it came with intense experiences. I'd love to hear from both of you on how those moments in the fields have influenced your approach to your work. Yes. Like uh, Chief Peaks uh, said, you know, he and I got to work together for many, many years. There's been so many times that he and I worked together on scenes that, that he and I, you know, Maybe we can't recall every single detail at this point, but it was certainly things that we'll never forget. Gruesome things that we saw or just very courageous things that we saw in one another or in our other firefighters, things that we kind of already talked about. It's just the determination uh, that, that builds when when somebody's called 911, it's their worst day ever. And so if you're the one called to be that person, you have to have the determination to no matter what it takes, no matter if it's sacrificing yourself, no matter if it's losing 24 hours of sleep, no matter if it's pushing your body to the limits or pushing your mind to the limits, you have to have the determination to push on and be that, I'm not going to say savior, but be that person that can get them through that situation, no matter what it is. And so um, that determination also breeds perseverance. And perseverance kind of co goes hand in hand in that determination, determination aspect, but persevering even when all the odds are stacked against you, even when it looks like there's no possible positive outcome, you still push on. In the fire service, those those can come in blackout conditions, smokes down to the ground, you can't see anything, but all you know is you have a job to do, and say that's search for somebody inside that house fire until you know for sure that you found them or they're not there. Not only has maybe Miss James stubbed her toe, but she's also been attacked by a dog or something like that. Or that she stubbed her toe because her floor caved in or something like that. And so you have to adapt on the fly and be prepared for an ever-changing, ever-dynamic scene. And firefighters do that extremely well. Paramedics do that extremely well. And our other Brethren in the emergency services do that well, whether that be police officers or, or EMTs, they do that extremely well. And it's a job that's it's not easy to do and it's not for everybody. But you learn very valuable lessons and you learn the content of people's hearts when you see them in those emergency situations and what they do. And also you learn a lot by experiencing the last moments, maybe of somebody's life there in that emergency scene that you're called to. You have to be there and you have to take that in and you have to learn kind of as much as you can about that person in that few seconds that, that you hold them to let them know that you care. So you have to have that empathy that Peaks was talking about a minute ago and you have to show that and you have to love wholeheartedly that person for the few seconds that you have with them because you might be the only one they have. You have to be 
you have to be Superman and you have to be their Cape Crusader. You have to be their knight in shining armor, but you have to be their best friend and you have to hold their hand potentially as they pass from this life to the next. And so those are very valuable lessons that you don't forget and that stay with you. Lay down at night and close your eyes and see all those faces that, that maybe you were the last one to see it. Um, other than their family when they buried them. You know, I used to tell people, when you see people in those gruesome situations and uh, whatever it is, it's like a little bit of your, your heart dies, or a little bit of your soul gets callous. It's easy to fall into a spirit of saltiness, to, to use a, a good word, and I think that can be seen in the medical field as well as the emergency response field. Um, you have to, you have to kind of wall off your heart, wall off your mind in order to do what you have to do to get the job. But those that can let down those barriers and uh, really truly love and truly reflect on the importance of those situations, they become much better and they learn how to be very empathetic and great at their jobs as Peaks has previously mentioned. So. That's my little soapbox on things learned from being an emergency response provider. And, and I'll always carry those things with me, no matter where I am or what I do or where I go. Absolutely. How about you, John? Yeah, that's a hard act to follow. Howard's exactly right. You know, the experiences we go to, there are good things we see and there's good moments, but a lot of it is pain, a lot of it's suffering for patients and since we do have that empathy i talked about it hurts us just as much you know howard hit a nerve talking about sometimes you're the last person to be with them and i remember you know people over the years that i was the last as they held my hand and i knew that their end was near and there was nothing i could do as medical professionals we are the answer most of the time, but we cannot be the answer all the time. That's what I've told people when we're training. You know, we will do what we can to give them the best chance. And without us, it may have come quicker or at all. But if it is their time to go, then it is their time to go. And you have to accept that. You know, so the intense situations are there. The patients that we remember when we go to sleep at night. They're there, but the silver lining is it is what drives us to continue to be better every day. It drives us to make ourselves better so that we are that person they need in that moment. You know, and some of what I say next comes from our days of training. Me and Howard, you know, taught the EMS side of uh, recruit school as well as the fire, but we, we taught these recruits that, you know, diamonds are formed in intense pressure and uh, teams are forged in adversity, a failure and hardship. So me and Howard, as, all, as well as others that we've worked with, and it's not just life-altering for the patients and their family, it's life-altering for us as well. It's had a major impact on how we approach the healthcare and, you know, the service. It's influ influenced us to be the best that we can be, and that forces us to train harder than we've ever trained and study longer than we've ever studied and to push ourselves to these limits we didn't think were possible me and howard and he kind of mentioned it we used to tell our trainees you know when people call 911 they expect superman you know or wonder woman or cape crusader like howard said so anything we do we should do it to the fullest and we should train you know religiously and rigorously to prepare for that single moment that means the most to someone else. We train to be that superhero when we have to be. So, you know, that experience is what keeps us motivated to continue to do that. Absolutely. And I, clearly your stories have, have shown how those tough times have really shaped how you handle the patient care. So, Dustin, balancing those experiences with medical school must be unique, I'm sure, <laughs> right now. Uh, uh, can you tell us about managing the demands of military service and academics? Yeah, for sure. So I, I'd love to uh, switching gears. So when when I left the fire department, I, I kind of worked at the fire department right up until I started VCOM. 
So literally the, the week before I was still a firefighter when I when I started medical school. So it was kind of like a action, 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 hands on. All <laughs> they're like, no, you have to study and just take test after test after test. You don't touch a patient. You don't whatever for these next two years. And so that I'm was sure that was an adjustment. It was a huge adjustment. I was, I know I said maybe I wasn't too smart previously, but I, I do know I'm smart. I never had to study as hard as I studied in the first block of medical school, uh, but it mm-hmm. was a really big wake up call. And so um, I had to push really hard and, and rely on that determination and perseverance that I learned that we just previously talked about. And for the most part, their priority is that I. I succeed in medical school and that I become a physician because that's the, the contract I kind of signed with them is that, hey, if you pay for my medical school and give me this living stipend every month, I will make sure that I pass medical school and then I serve as a physician for you guys at the end of it. And so that's kind of their top priority and in a way my top priority as well because I kind of signed my life away. And so that's that in and of itself is adds a lot of pressure and a lot of weight onto everything, especially already when you're in medical school, you're you're faced with the fact that like, hey, if I don't pass this test, I'm gonna fail out and get kicked out of medical school. And that alone for somebody who hasn't signed a contract is mm-hmm. is very tough. Um, but when you add on the fact that like, hey, if I fail out of medical school, like I have to pay back all of this money that the Air Force has paid and I lose my rank and I get kicked out of the Air Force. And so it's like, holy cow, like what what then? <laughs> you know, so, so every right. test that comes along, you like have to pass this. Like the 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 ramifications of me not passing it is just too big that I, I can't come to terms with how devastating that would be. So I have to pass. And so it just adds a lot of weight, if nothing else, balancing the two. It also Imagine. gives you, gives you, because medical school is like a, is like a blender. It'll chew you up and it'll spit you out and you'll be exhausted and you like haven't done anything physically, but yet I'm exhausted. And then you look back and you're like, well, I haven't slept in like two or three days because I've just studied nonstop and so I'm mm-hmm. exhausted and uh, you feel inadequate at times. You feel depressed. At times, uh, you feel like the amount of material that you're required to learn and to study and to know is insurmountable. And there's many times where you look yourself in the mirror and you're like, am I even in the right place? Should I be doing this? Is this what I'm supposed Mm -hmm. to do? What if I just gave? You stare at yourself long in the mirror and you ask yourself those questions. For me, I'm married and I have a wife, and so that that's that's an, an extra reason for me. So not only do I owe a duty to myself to pass and succeed in something that I said, hey, I'm going to finish, and I'm going to do this. So so personally, I have it as me, myself, and I, I want to succeed mm-hmm. and finish what I started. And so then I have my wife who's like, well, she depends on me to finish what I started. It's an extra reason. So mm-hmm. it, it also gives you that extra reason. So it's not. It's not all weight. It's also another other motivation because at the end of the day, I signed up for the Air Force to serve others and to serve my country. That above all else is is one of the greatest sacrifices you can make. Yes, it is a high honor that I hold in high esteem, and so it will always be that extra reason for me. And as far as at least what the Air Force re- requires out of me, and this might be different branch to branch. Other than attending officer school, which is basically basic training for military officers, they don't require too much more out of you other than filling out some paperwork or attending some meetings or uh, doing short rotations in different places. So they kind of leave you alone as long as you uh, have some organization skills and turn in your stuff on time and be where you're supposed to be. It's not really uh, too much of a too much of a hassle dealing with that uh, extra weight, but um, it is that one more thing in the back of your mind, whether it be that one more consequence or that one more uh, ambition to succeed. So 
Uh, I guess that would be the gravity of, of balancing both because medical school is difficult all on its own, but then you add on. Sounds like it's tough, but definitely overall rewarding kind of. John, I'd like to turn now to you. <laughs> now, having worked alongside many EMTs and paramedics, what strengths do you see uh, for them bringing into the future for healthcare roles? Yep, that's a great question. Uh, before I answer, I was thinking a minute ago, I do find it funny that Howard's in the Air Force because when we used to PT for the fire department, we actually PT next to the Air Force ROTC for Auburn University. And we would purposefully do harder exercises than them. Really? And then Howard ended up joining the Air Force. So I thought it was kind of funny. It looked like they were having a good time, Peaks. <laughs> they listened to music and dance. Or... They, could, they jazzercised a few times. That's, yeah. yeah no, jazzercised? It looked more fun than what we were doing. So. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> answer your question, you know, what, what skills do these EMTs and paramedics have for these future healthcare roles? You know, future physicians like Howard, I think, brings a lot to the table. There's a large difference in the mindset of emergency medicine and pre hospital care and definitive care in that hospital setting. I know Howard can attest to that because he lived both lives. You know, lived the life of a firefighter paramedic and is currently starting his life as a physician. But there's a big difference. We're, we're on the same team, yes, but where we meet these patients is different. These firefighters meet them and the situations where it's very critical there's a lot of safety that has to be considered and there's a lot of risk to not only their life but ours external risk that in a hospital you don't necessarily have a lot it's not like you have fires that are threatening you know your back while you're trying to drag a patient out of a house so what does that give these firefighters paramedics um you know what edge does that give them in our future healthcare role is we'll, we're trained to perform in the highest distressful situations. So we're taught to take a complex and dynamic scene and make order out of chaos. We don't always have the number of resources that a hospital has, but we're trained to adapt and overcome in any situation with the resources that we have uh, to make use of you know, what we have and to succeed regardless of that circumstance. We're often put in extremely life-threatening situations and expected to perform, you know, emergency medical tasks. All in the while, our lives are being threatened and, you know, these tributes will benefit these future doctors and physicians like Howard. And the situations, you know, he'll be presented with will have a level of stress, you know, my wife is a nurse so I, I do see that side of it forgot to state earlier but man howard actually rode the ambulance for about six years together on our days off for the hospital so we you know dealt a lot with emergency rooms and that definitive care side of the pre-hospital care you know so there are stress levels in these emergency rooms and you know these surgery rooms but it's not going to amount to that stress that's presented when you're in a house fire you know, in extreme blackout conditions and being asked to perform healthcare needs on these victims that you locate in full turnout gear, you know, middle of the night when you were sleeping. So what, what, how does that help these future doctors? Well, you know, I know Howard will remain cool, calm, and collected during these procedures. I've seen him remain cool and calm and collected during house fires. So I can only imagine he will during a procedure. It's going to enable him to seamlessly succeed in these situations or these procedures that they're leading or participating in. Now, witness Howard enter burning buildings with no fear and great confidence. Now, if he was scared or didn't have confidence, he didn't show it to me at least. Uh, you know, I've been with him while he succeeded in these unfavorable situations and stood by his side when he triumphed, when these others have failed. As you know, so I've witnessed this, firsthand with Howard specifically, but I think anyone that has this background brings to the future healthcare roles a significant, you know, a tribute and uh, 
will be a significant asset to whatever organization they work for. So being that firefighter mag is still the number of valuable tributes that can only be forged from, you know, cliche the fire in our jobs. So I think there's a significant amount, you know, skills and mindset uh, tributes that we get from this job that will help these future healthcare professionals. Absolutely. That's great to hear. And um, as you both know, the training plays a huge role in preparation. How do you feel that your demanding background have prepared you for your role in emergency services and healthcare? Yeah. So, um, so training is, is kind of paramount. In emergency response, as you mentioned, you know, it's like preparing for the worst, hoping for the best, but still expecting the best to go wrong. And so you have to have to be prepared for that. It kind of goes back to kind of where we started in the podcast is, is you have to strive to be the best at whatever you're doing each and every day. Because you never know when your number is going to get called. You never know when it's going to be uh, you with a tool in your hand. Um, as as a physician, when somebody says, "Hey, doctor, you do this," you know, like like you're the one that has to be be the guy or the girl to to do it. And so, training and preparation is is paramount. And as a firefighter and a paramedic, it looked different than what it looks like currently as a physician. Because for me, like my power and my strength is is in between my ears right now whereas that's reading a ton that's uh, taking practice questions that's seeing patients that's looking at x-rays looking at mris looking at ct scans like trying to figure out the intricate anatomy of the human body and uh, the cellular processes and and all sorts of other stuff that just sound awful for anybody else who's not interested <laughs> so Somebody just listened to is like, nah, it's not for me. For for people that want to be physicians, it, it's interesting and it's, and it's and it's the necessary training for you to be the one to make that critical diagnosis that saves somebody's life or to not miss that developing cancer per se early on in a patient's treatment where it can literally save their life because if you miss it and you don't catch it till later, then that's the difference in them living and dying. So you have to train and prepare that knowledge and build that wisdom up so that you can always be prepared for the wild, wacky, kind of unicorn patient that is supposed to never exist, you know, but all of a sudden they walk into your into your clinic or they walk into the hospital and there they are. You have to have that knowledge of reading about this one thing and say, you know what, that kind of sounds like this, you know, and, and catch that. And so that's the training and preparation that a physician goes through. And let me tell you, that knowledge is very, very broad because if nothing else, in the first two years of medical school, I learned that just the surface level of medicine is extremely broad. But then being out on rotation and seeing how much these physicians who've been doing it for years actually know it's like leaps and bounds beyond what medical school uh, teaches you it's like medical school extra extra plus the, the knowledge that they have so it is extremely remarkable the training and preparation that they do but on the, on the fire service and the emergency response side uh, you have to be able to solve problems with your mind as well as your body so it was it was brawn and brain that you had to uh, kind of prepare and depending on where you were in the chain of command so as a, as a firefighter you don't have to think too much you kind of get told what to do and you just focus on the brawn aspect of it you're the grunt and you have to train to be the grunt and be the grunt well as you start to climb the ladder and you become an apparatus operator so you're driving the truck then so you, you have to be you have to know everything there is to know about driving the truck and you still have to know how to be the grunt if it's called upon and then you level up to maybe you're an officer now so maybe you're a sergeant so now you have to start using that big brain of yours uh, to try to to try to prepare and um, command others to do things um, as well as still staying visibly strong and then a lieutenant is a similar 
And then when you get to captain or chief level, like like peaks, you're doing a lot of a lot of brain work because um, you're commanding. That. So the training looks different at the different level, but the mindset is still the same. You practice how you play, and you train for the worst, hope for the best, but expect even the best to go wrong. And so you you have to rise to the occasion and be prepared to do that. Absolutely. How about you, John? Do you want to piggyback off of that? Yeah. Asking the double questions because, or to let me go first because Howard's hard to follow. I, I will say with the physicians, you know, they are a lot smarter than I will ever be. And I say that because I, I jokingly, when I talk to people about my job as a paramedic is I'm trained to keep patients alive for 10 minutes. And that's pretty easy. Physicians are trained to keep patients alive as long as they can. So they have contact with these patients for weeks, months, years after the incident. And so you have to use a lot of brain power, like Howard was saying, to think about, you know, what can I do today that will help them in two years? Whereas a paramedic, I'm just like, okay, we have five miles to get to the hospital. What can I do to keep them alive till I can give this to a doctor that knows things better than I do? So, you know, going back to that training, uh, and I think what Howard said at the very beginning is, is one of the most important is that training and preparation is paramount. You know, yes, I'm a good firefighter, but I'll probably be a horrible doctor because I haven't trained to be one. You know, Howard is currently trained to be one. So for those listening, I, I'm here to tell you that training is one of the most important things and not just training initially, like in school when you're getting these certifications, but that continuing training, continuing to research on your own and to learn these procedures, you know, outside of the book to dedicate that time, your own time to these things so that you will be a you know, good at whatever job you do. It's, I went through fire school 16 years ago. But we say in the fire service that you train and learn until the day you retire. You know, things can be said about physicians. I'm sure the physicians that have been doing it 30 years are still training and learning. You know, you asked with the military and the emergency response, how does it prepare for the challenges? Well, it equips these individuals with the essential skills and mindsets that are highly beneficial. And some of that deals with our ability to continue to want to get better, like we discussed earlier. But just to kind of bullet point this out, you know, crisis management, decision making, teamwork, and communication, and all of these go hand in hand with the hospital setting and pre hospital, the resilience and stress management of it. Very importantly, your adaptability and your problem solving. I think that's super important for physicians because like Howard said, you are a problem solver as a physician. You're presented with something that maybe you've seen before, but sometimes you haven't. And you are being asked to be that problem solver. Discipline and attention to detail is key as well. You want to be a discipline in your skill set but have that great attention to detail, um, especially as a physician, is, you know, if we make a, a small error on a fire scene, it may go unnoticed, but you make a small error in the operating room, that could alter somebody's life. So having that attention to detail is key. You know, and then it goes back to what I said at the beginning is just empathy. Now, your service-oriented mindset, you know, why do we do what we do? It, 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 we care, and when you care about something, and anyone can attest to this position or not, when we care about the things we're doing, we tend to try a little harder and go a little deeper to get that positive and successful result. So Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that, both of you, again, and all <laughs> High pressure experiences have shaped your approach to both emergency services and healthcare. Um, Dustin, um, as someone balancing both military services and medical school, what advice do you give for individuals, not just 
whether they're in the military background or not, who are considering a career in healthcare. I'll say this, and this is a, a thought that I formed as I was applying to medical school and preparing, is that if anyone can persuade you not to do it, don't do it. But if despite everyone's efforts to dissuade you and to say, hey, you don't want to do that, that's a lot of hard work, that's, you know, like, that's a lot of your life that you're sacrificing, and you still say, I don't care, I want to do it, and then pursue it with all your might and all your strength, all your heart, your soul, and your spirit. And don't ever give up because if that's your dream and you push it to the wayside and you go down the road 20 years and you look back and maybe you've had a career in something else, but you look back and say, you know what? I really wish I would have done. And, and you're faced with that regret because you, you talked yourself out of it. But if it's something that you're passionate about and something that weighs heavy on your heart and on your mind, go for it wholeheartedly because you won't, you won't regret the journey no matter how hard it is because you know that you have worked towards something that means the world to you, it means that you have accomplished what you felt like you were called to do. You always want to have that, that feeling in your heart, especially when it comes to the end and uh, you look back on your, on your last say 50, 60, 80 years, 100 years if you can make it that far and say, you know what, I, I did something that I felt led to do um, and that I felt called to do. And no matter the mistakes I, I made along the way, I pursued my ambitions with all, with all my heart. And so if that's you maybe thinking about medical school, if that's you maybe thinking about military service, or if that's you trying to combine the two, like myself, know that there's, there's no greater calling than to serve the country, and there's no greater calling than to serve others. And so pursue those with all your heart and spirit, because the people that pay your checks are the people that live next door to you, because everybody pays taxes. So they're the, they're the ones signing your paycheck. You're not just getting money from the government. Uh, you are working for all of those around you. If you're if you join the military and if you're a physician in the military, you're working for those who signed up to work for others as well. So you are treating the the soldiers, the airmen, the sailors, whatever branch you're in, who are sacrificing their lives for this country and are serving our great country uh, with all their heart, soul, and spirit, because that's what they felt called to do. You as a physician in the military branch are treating them helping them and their families. And so you almost have a double duty to not only your country and your fellow citizens, but to those soldiers, to those sailors, to those airmen who are serving their country as well. Work very hard, train very hard, try to just be the best that you can be. Well, that's definitely great advice, Dustin. And so, John, uh, you've seen Dustin's qualities in action. What do you think will make him an impactful physician, and where do you see him making the greatest impact? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and I'm glad I'm able to speak firsthand and watching Howard uh, throughout the fire service and kind of knowing how he's going to project himself as a physician. Uh, so the qualities that I you know speak of, I witness these with Howard firsthand. You know, he, Howard is very calm under pressure. I guess that earlier, he never seemed like he was nervous to enter a house fire or to take charge on a cardiac arrest. He may have been, but he never showed it to me. He consistently demonstrated that ability to stay calm in these high stress and chaotic situations. His skill in managing that pressure will be invaluable as a physician, especially in you know your emergency settings where quick, clear headed decisions are critical to patient outcomes. You know, one of the biggest attributes I've witnessed Howard is his uh, work ethic. His most unparalleled to what I've seen. His discipline and dedication, he's proven his commitment to serving others time and time again. Uh, he's worked these long hours, uh, physically demanding tasks. You know, 
when Howard would do something at the station, he would do it at 110% till the job was done. And that is not a quality you see very often in any profession. I wish we saw it more, but Howard was the guy at the station that you could ask to do something. And you knew that if he did it wrong, he would restart from ground zero just to do it right. And would sometimes dedicate more time to this task than you know, we thought was feasible or healthy. Um, at the beginning, I had to, to learn how to be part of a team uh, in recruit school, but quickly caught on. And uh, then he ended up being one of the best teammates uh, that I'd ever seen, teammate with me and teammate with others. Uh, he understood that importance of teamwork. He was part of a close-knit firefighting unit. So, you know, that experience will equip him to excel in the medical environment where you have to work collaboratively with nurses and EMTs, paramedics, and other healthcare professionals. Uh, I know these physicians don't just talk to physicians. They, a lot of times, lead these teams of nurses and therapists. I've been in these code rooms when we're working a code. I've seen what these physicians do, and they are leaders. Well, the fire service breeds leaders. So I think that Howard will excel in being a leader out there in the medical field. Stated earlier, adaptability and problem solving. Howard was very good at this. He's, uh, he was able to think on his feet quickly and adapt to these new challenges. You know, it was essential in his role as a firefighter, uh, but it'll be highly beneficial in medicine too, where he's going to have the ability to diagnose complex cases address these same complications in, you know, being a paramedic, I know this, you do something you think is right because that's what you're trying to do. And then the outcome is not what you expected. You know, that happens. It, it, we're talking practicing medicine here. So it happens. And then what do we do in those moments? Do we adapt? Do we overcome? Do we freeze, flight, flee? You know, I've seen Howard, he, defaults to making decisions he tries to figure it out as quick as he can and he was very good at that as a firefighter howard's a you know he called me a sensitive guy at the beginning but he's sympathetic empathetic uh, he's got a lot of compassion for others i've noticed that about him he looks like he's tough acts like he's tough but he's a very sympathetic and empathetic person he witnesses these people in these vulnerable moments and developed a strong sense of empathy and compassion uh, he understands uh, and has a caring nature that I think will be essential in building and trusting relationships. You know, physicians Absolutely. being in contact with these patients for extended periods of time, they have to build relationships. You know, and I think that I've never met somebody that wasn't, you know, attracted to Howard, like, you know, emotionally. He's got the ability to walk around and make friends. And I think that'll take him far places and uh, be in a position. You know, his power was a very resilient uh, when it came to physical and mental challenges. Uh, that was one of his greatest attributes that I witnessed. I think he came into the fire service with this, honestly. But I think that in the fire service, he perfected that skill. But there wasn't a single thing Howard, you know, would, when it came to mental and physical resilience, there wasn't anything that would get him he would figure out a way to succeed we used to joke in recruit school when we were his instructors in 2014-15 we would try to punish the group uh, or motivate is what we would call it with physical exercise and Howard was unfazed and it was so frustrating to us because he would just do these things and smile the whole time now if he was hurting on the inside I, I don't know but we could not find anything that would make him break down. So maybe the military has been more successful in that than us. But, you know, and then uh, lastly, as we could go on all night about Howard's attributes, but his attention to detail and protocol was uh, amazing to watch. You know, we taught attention to detail in recruit schools. And when Howard was with me as a co-instructor, he preached what he trained. So he, he was the instructor that would tell these recruits what to do. He would do it himself. 
And so it has this, it had a strong adherence to protocols and uh, detail and uh, he was precise, uh, he was thorough, meticulous at times. So that's invaluable when it comes to being a physician. It stated earlier, you need attention to detail. One small mistake on the operating table can change a life. Uh, and I think he'll deliver that uh, exceptionally well. So I think all of those qualities make Howard exceptionally well suited for a career in medicine. You know, his blend of resilience, compassion, and dedication to service will undoubtedly make him a meaningful impact to his future patients and uh, colleagues as well. Absolutely. Dustin, do you have a response to all that? Well, he's trying to make me tear up and cry because he's been so kind to me. No, uh, I just want to say that that me and Peaks are, are very good friends, and um, I know you can probably tell throughout this podcast, but we spent a lot of time together. We did a lot of very tough things together. We did, Peaks and I went through a training called Smoke Diver Training uh, together, okay. and uh, at that time, less than um, less than 400 firefighters in the state of Alabama had gone through that class and gained that certification. Extremely difficult, extremely tough. We were the only two in all of East Alabama for a while um, until some others have gone through recently. As he said, we, we spent close to, close to a decade, um, really about eight years, training hundreds of firefighters together. Um, and a lot of these great attributes that Peaks has maybe pointed out in myself, I learned a lot of them from him. As iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And so I owe a lot of my best qualities to him and the other people that I worked with in the fire service and, and the other leaders um, that that taught me, helped me form the type of leader and the type of person that I want to be. And so I just want to thank him very much for all his kind words but just to let him know that I'm holding up a mirror because all those all those great things are what he possesses as well. That's probably why I am the way I am. And despite what he said about looking tough and acting tough, I like to, I like to think I look pretty handsome. Um, so, <laughs> no, no, no. But I, I just want to thank him for all, all his kind words and for sharing yeah. time with me on, on the podcast. Yeah, I did Absolutely. Uh, one quick thing uh, Howard mentioned earlier that uh, w there's things we don't forget. Well, there's a short story of uh, how I was very frustrated with Howard probably for the first time in my life. We didn't even, I thought of it when he mentioned smoke divers. So they had tasked me and Howard. We were partners for this uh, particular evolution. But they had tasked us with crawling through a pipe that was 24 inches in diameter you know, our gear and seen firefighters in movies with air pack and everything, 24 inches and us don't really match very well. And I'm not the smallest person. And so I attempted to go in this pipe first and kind of got wedged. And so I backed out and then Howard being slightly smaller than me went in before me and it was nighttime. So you couldn't see anything. And the instructors had said, just crawl until you find a lift and then take a lift and then crawl until you find another lift. So we crawled on our fingers and toes, moving a millimeter second. Mind you, we're on air that has a limited amount. And, you know, in this pipe, if we run out of air, you can't get the mask off. So I don't really know what they would have done. I guess we would have suffocated until somebody dragged us out. But we took our first left, and then we crawled for, in my mind, a long amount of time. Not anything to keep me going was watching Howard's pack. Uh, had a blinking light on it. It was anything that was kind of keeping me going forward without freaking out in this tube. And we kept crawling and kept crawling. And the instructor told us, if you miss the second left, you're just going to keep crawling under the road and then there's no way out. Well, I thought Howard had missed it. So, because I wasn't paying attention to the lifts because I was just watching his pack. Well, I asked Howard, did you miss the left? And I figured he was going to be very confident, but he said, I'm not sure. And I was so frustrated. I told him, if we get out of this pipe, we might get in a fight. We'll find out. Did not miss the left, and we found it. 
But, uh, you know, it was one of the things I remember just throughout our years, little things like that to remember. Well, it's, it's clear that uh, Dustin's commitment and skills have really left a strong impression on you, John. Myself and a lot of the department, so it's not just me that felt that way. Well, thank you both, Dustin and John, for sharing your stories and insights on today's episode. So thank you for joining. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe so you never miss an update. And feel free to share it with friends or colleagues who may benefit from these stories. Stay connected with us on social media for more behind-the-scenes content and updates. Until next time, stay inspired, stay engaged, and keep making a difference in healthcare and beyond. Thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Become Auburn Beyond the White Coat. We hope you found the insights and stories that we shared today both informative and inspiring. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and our website for more updates and resources. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the fascinating world of healthcare.